My name is Nora Merzuki. I'm part of the Philly Palestine Coalition and Leila Legidor and organizing around narrative and storytelling and creating spaces for community members to care for each other and build together. The Philly Palestine Coalition is organizing with folks against displacement, against uh, police brutality, uh, and fighting for a society and an economy that, that really works for all and allows people to flourish. I think I've always been very politically minded. My father would always have conversations with me. He had a very deep belief in this idea of the U.S. democracy. Uh, as an immigrant from Egypt. And then 9-11 happened and the narrative that was built totally changed the relationship and how community dealt with my father. I think my role in creating social change is really about encouraging collaboration and creating spaces for communities and individuals to find their voice and feel the agency to amplify that voice and creating opportunities for people to understand that we all have different roles. The movement isn't built solely from actions. It's built through the narrative. It's built through popular education. It's built through even electoral politics. Cutting the access to the ability to live a flourishing life and to be you in your fullest sense is an act of violence. The narrative makes it okay for the government to enact its violence against BIPOC individuals and against anyone who speaks out for justice, uh, who speaks out against capitalism, who speaks out for the rights of all people to live freely. My name is Shujad Moore. I'm a filmmaker, I'm a community advocate, and I'm a West Philadelphian. From my earliest days, I grew up in a household where I saw a matriarch, great-grandmother, Alice Jones. She was a domestic worker, but when she got home, she was the mayor of Sansom Street, and the house was filled with love, food, activity, people coming in and out. That was the world that I knew. Fast forward 30 years later, that's not the community that we live in right now. I think it's known that I've done a lengthy time in prison, and once I returned home, I just saw that the same way in which I was rebuilding my life and that I had to rebuild my mentality, I saw from my home to my family, to my community, to even the society we live in, we need a lot of revitalization. One of the things that I benefited from while I was incarcerated was that I had love. I was born into a family of love, and it, it, it was a difference maker in terms of how I was able to navigate being incarcerated versus other people. And um, they, there's a phrase that says, uh, to whom much is given, much is required. The same way in which I, I receive love means I have to give love. I'm in a neighborhood that my mother grew up in. My, we're in the house my grandmother lived in, my mother was raised in, my great-grandmother lived in this neighborhood. That's very meaningful, especially in today's time when we see communities being pushed out for new communities to enter. To be able to stand here and say, uh, you know, we're here to stay. So I'm committed to doing whatever I have to do to help others be able to thrive. Community means love. Community means everyone working together on one accord to make sure that we all live a beautiful life and we all have a high quality life. And again, that's something that I try to work with with my community garden, revitalizing the playground, my film work, just going outside and smiling and speaking to people and representing, hey, I'm, I'm your neighbor, I love you, and I'm actually here to serve you. And the more I do that, the more you do that for me, the better we all live. So my name is AJ Scruggs. My pronouns are he, him, they, them, and king. Use them all or just use my name. I am also the founder and executive director of Visible Truth 365. I started Visible Truth 365 as a way to highlight black trans, greatness, excellence, uh, some of the work that we're doing because it's not really highlighted, especially black trans men. We have four bills that we have introduced to the state legislator. Um, one is for non-discrimination in schools, bathroom and locker room policies, inclusive LGBTQ curriculum and education because we need to see ourselves in the world to feel valid. And lastly, non-disclosure. I have a problem that adults feel the need to police kids on even exploring an identity. The social change that I am working towards is the decriminalization of transness, HIV, 
blackness. If I don't disclose, I could be thrown in jail. If I am walking in the wrong neighborhood and somebody feels threatened, they can call the cops and I am automatically assumed to be in the wrong because I am identified as a black man. If I am in a more conservative space and somebody outs me as trans, my life is then in danger. So I want to decriminalize existing for people to have intersectional identities. My existence is radical. I am a black, unapologetic, queer, trans man living with HIV and I don't let any of my intersections go without uh, being represented. Speaking truth to power has always been one of my stronger suits. I'm not gonna be here all the way. So um, to create a lane that somebody else can continue digging and carving out, like I want to be the adult that little AJ needed to see, to be inspired, to be motivated, to, to know that it's okay to exist without internalized stigma, without shame, and making sure that adults don't get to pick on kids. My name is Erica Guadalupe Nunez. I'm the executive director of Juntos. Juntos is a community-led immigrant rights organization in South Philly. What inspired me to get into immigrant rights organizing specifically is growing up undocumented. Growing up um, in an undocumented family, the experience of migrating to the U.S. as a young child, and steadily as I grew older, the repeated lack of access to certain institutions for not having a social security number. But more than anything, I think it was living in fear, and specifically living in fear of my loved ones getting detained or deported. Like when I think about state violence and one of the agencies that perpetrates the most harm on immigrant communities, I think I very much think about ICE. And ICE is an agency that didn't exist when I was eight years old. You know, it was something that was formed post 9-11 and in a way has served sort of as a vehicle for the U.S. to enact um, xenophobic policies. We mobilize against state violence specifically as sort of calling out the policies that exist in the U.S. that seek to dehumanize, criminalize, and dispose of people. Um, and we see that at the border, we see that at detention centers, like we never heard of someone getting detained when I was little. Now, you know, we have a detention center in our state that they can detain 1,800 people. And a lot of these centers are tied or run by private prison companies. And so in a lot of ways, you know, ICE is just an extension of the private prison complex. And there's a lot of money that gets spent into detaining and deporting members of my community. But it's every day I get a call that someone got picked up. At Juntos, I think we often meet people on the worst day of their life. Juntos is a trusted hub where the place people go to when the most unimaginable thing is happening to them. And so as part of our work at Juntos, you know, that is really important to us, that when someone arrives, that they're met with that value of like radical care. Our focus is to make sure they can have a life of dignity. My name is Rabbi Alyssa Wise, and I am the founder and lead organizer of Rabbis for Ceasefire, an organization that has sprouted up since October 2023 um, in the wake of the moral crisis facing the Jewish community as Israel's brutal assault of Gaza is now in its 230th day as we're recording this. I have been an organizer um, in the Palestinian rights movement, broadly defined since 2000, um, when I had a change of heart in politics after spending a year in Jerusalem at the Hebrew University there. I then went on to learn all I could about uh, organizing and direct action and movement building. When I was studying to become a rabbi, I spent summers in the West Bank doing human rights observation work with a group called the International Women's Peace Service, where I did protective presence accompanying work there. The violence that happens in Israel-Palestine doesn't stay within those borders. What we've been seeing in the past couple months of the state violence that we're seeing at the student encampments looks very much like what I experienced the summers I spent in the West Bank at Palestinian protests, right? We know about police exchange programs between the U.S. and Israel. So the work of, you know, my last couple decades has been about calling Jews off the sidelines of watching unmitigated support for Israel and its policies of occupation and apartheid. We released a video um, calling Jews into the ceasefire movement and reminding Jews that Jewish tradition is one that affirms life and pursues peace. For a lot of Jewish history, 
it was dangerous to be Jewish in public and to continue being Jewish. And I feel a debt to being part of ensuring that Judaism endures as scaffolding for a meaningful and ethical life. But I can't allow Judaism to be used as a fig leaf for um, the state violence and repression of another people, which is what is happening in Israel-Palestine. It's actually really easy for me to picture a Philadelphia free of state violence because I feel blessed that I live in a community where we are already practicing the kind of solidarity that I think that it takes. The answer to the idea that Jews or any people could only be safe if they have this state of their own is understanding that actually true safety doesn't come from insularity or putting ourselves behind higher walls. It comes from relationships of solidarity and mutual support. My name is Noor and I'm a core organizer with the Philly Palestine Coalition and I've been doing organizing with the coalition for about four years now. We uh, were members of another coalition called the Black and Brown Coalition and we were doing a lot of Palestine specific organizing but tying it to the local as well um, and we had our first rally in 2021 um, around the Sheikh Jarrah um, uprisings and it was around then that we started to see that there were a lot of people doing work around Palestine and for Palestine that didn't really know each other so that was um, kind of when a more informal coalition began to emerge where our main focus was just having people um, meet each other, know each other, figure out ways that we can collaborate with one another. As dire and horrible as the circumstances are right now, um, it's really great to see how people are really mobilizing their own communities, whether it be like families with Families for a Ceasefire or like writers that are like formed within like Writers Against the War on Gaza. The coalition's ultimate vision is to amplify the demands and the voices of Palestinians in the occupied territories. It is our U.S. tax dollars that is funding genocide when it could be funding education, it could be funding healthcare more food security uh, by pushing like for a free palestine or a liberated palestine by pushing for divestment also to try creating more of a space in a community where we rely and center on each other rather than on the state which is um something that you know black brown indigenous communities poor communities have been doing for a really long time already have our hope and our strength like lie in ourselves rather than in systems that have continuously like hurt us and failed us and caused a lot of violence on us too My name is Farah Parks. I've been the executive director of Gender Justice Fund for the past five years. My name is Sherella Williams, and I am the board chair for Gender Justice Fund. So our organization's history is either really long or really short, depending on how you think about it. Uh, we were started in 1882, ostensibly to support women going into the workforce. So that really meant white women going into the workforce, because women of color had been in the workforce for a long time. So, and we were started as New Century Guild, and they established a trust, which what Gender Justice Fund grew out of. Our more recent history really begins in 2016, when the organization hired its first executive director, my predecessor who um, encouraged the board to sell a building that had long been part of War Legacy and have the organization move away from being focused on women's history and really lean into being a foundation. In 2020, we changed our name, became Gender Justice Fund and adopted a new mission focused on fighting all forms of gender-based oppression. Our core philanthropic programs focus on systems change, culture change, and uh, trans resilience. Our vision is a Philadelphia and a world that is free of gender-based oppression. It is what we fight for, it is what we fundraise on behalf of, and is what we move our resources as a foundation towards. And we do this work in a way that intentionally redistributes power so that those that are most affected by the injustice are able to have the space and the network and the funds to lead the solutions. Feels very natural to stand in opposition to state violence because many of the laws and policies of the state enact violence on our bodies in some way, shape, or form. 
One thing that I wish more people knew or understood about the work that we do is that it is very intersectional. We support labor rights, we support affordable housing, we support access to quality public education, we support dignity in prisons and dignity as returning citizens. So when I think of a Philadelphia and, and a world free of state violence, for me it is less about what I see and imagining how I would feel to be able to walk outside with less tension in my body, to take a deep breath knowing that my right to exist with dignity and that my right to bodily autonomy is protected and even celebrated. And I just hope that one day we can all feel like that. It is so wonderful to see everybody yeah. here. Um, yeah. I know Woo. it's been a true labor of love, so we really just wanted to recognize the plaintiffs, recognize the committee, and recognize, recognize the grantees and all of the wonderful work you're already doing. Even though me and I, at least our attorneys, we recognize that solidarity work is so much stronger than litigation in terms of mm -hmm. what's actually yeah. gonna move yeah. the needle yeah. and make a difference. So mm -hmm. yeah. we couldn't miss the opportunity to have everybody in one room. Hi, my name is Kara McClellan. I'm the director of the Advocacy for Racial and Civil Justice Clinic at Penn Carey Law School. So our clients were individuals who were impacted on May 31st, 2020 by excessive force by police in their community. Um, tear gassing, rubber bullets, armored tank, military style weapons. So that was the basis of the lawsuit. Ultimately, the lawsuit resulted in a settlement um, in 2023 with the city of Philadelphia. And so our clients really came up with this idea um, and we negotiated as a part of the settlement, this idea of the West Philadelphia Community Fund. Half a million dollars that would be coming from the city directly to communities and um, people directly impacted in West Philadelphia. They decided to disperse the funding um, either directly to gr grassroots organizations who are providing community healing or grassroots organizations who are doing organizing um, to ensure that West Philadelphia can really thrive as a community. And really all of our clients, you know, were leaders in ensuring that, that a agreement was reached um, that met what they thought was critical. Um, but I need to in particular um, acknowledge Ant Smith, who was um, a tremendous leader throughout all of this. My name is Patricia Vickers, but a lot of people in prison call me Mama Pat, and when they've come home, they still call me Mama Pat. The work that I do is fighting for the human rights of people in prison, and also second chances for people who are in prison serving a life sentence to come home. I got involved in this work through my son, who was a juvenile lifer. I was concerned about his safety as a 17-year-old in prison with adults. And through that, we started the Human Rights Coalition. I realized that even though I started out for selfish reasons, just because I wanted to help my son, as I grew to know the other people in prison, I saw them as intelligent, kind, loving human beings. And I started helping them too. I'm most proud of the relationships I built doing this work and showing people that you're not alone bringing awareness to what's going on with the men and women inside prisons is our way of, of fighting against this. My vision of Philadelphia free from state violence is alternatives to prison. I don't believe that children should be locked up. I definitely don't believe that children should be locked up for life. So my vision is having a, a system that looks at people as human beings and not as dollar signs and not as labels, but having alternatives to help people as opposed to just lock them up. What I wish more people knew about my work is that you don't have to be in, in the, in the uh, limelight. You don't have to be you know, the best speaker, which I know I'm not. Uh, you don't have to be another Martin Luther King, you know, but you can do a lot to help people by just reaching out. I wish most people knew that it's the small things that count.
And my full name is uh, Masaru Edmund Nakawanase. And I was born in a internment camp in Poston, Arizona, where uh, people of Japanese descent were held during World War II, basically imprisoned because of their ancestry. In the, in the 50s, I became quite drawn to the civil rights movement. After graduating from high school in 1962, that spring was the, the spring of the, the, the Birmingham movement. And that was just earth shaking for me. So by the fall, it was clear to me, the civil rights movement was something I wanted to be a part of. So I dropped out of college and not knowing anybody and vice versa, <laughs> uh, I, went, uh, I went south to Atlanta and uh, walked into the office of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee with a youth-led civil rights group. And within about a, I guess it was a month and a half, I was on the staff. <laughs> a lot of social movements are like that at the beginning. I mean, it's very open and it was exciting. I mean, it was clear I was part of something huge. When you worked in the civil rights movement in the South in the 60s, it was inevitable to encounter state violence. To me, state violence means the use of the instruments of the state operating under the color of law to basically hold insurgency at bay or to totally smash it. Got in, very much involved in the local anti-war movement. I, uh, I was offered the position of being national representative for Native American Affairs at the Friends Service Committee, based in Philadelphia. And that was an eye-opener for me too, you know, dealing with land issues in Maine, treaty rights in South Dakota, prisoners in California, fishing rights in Washington State, all and all around issues of what, what was seen as sovereignty or so, you know, in other parts of the world would were called self-determination. I think as more more and more people understand it, the, they'll they'll draw more and more support. I mean, it's a it's a it's an issue of justice ultimately, and uh, I, I I I do think that on this general issue and as with others there's probably no substitute for public mobilization movements the, the array of forces that are against justice are, are enormous you know the moneyed interests the whole um, apparatus of capitalism basically uh, so what do we have we have people we have ideals. Those will make a difference. Those always make a difference.